Jonathan, tell us a little bit about you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is John Pan, currently head of eSports for Brave Ventures. Brave Ventures is based in New York. Uh, we typically work on TV clients such as Turner, CBS, guys like that. We just started a new eSports division because a lot of networks are obviously interested in this space. So we do a combination of advising, investing, as well as creating content. Uh, prior to Brave, I owned an eSports team. And prior to that, I was a product manager at Riot Games. Hey guys, my name is Todd Harris, uh, co-founder, chief operating officer of a studio called Hi Res Studios. We make uh, primarily PC and console games that are free to play. Our biggest game is Smite. It's a mythology-themed third-person MOBA. And uh, I can give you the perspective of a developer, publisher, and how we look at eSports. So Smite last year was the fourth biggest game as far as prizing paid out. So it went Dota 2, League of Legends, Counter-Strike Go, Smite. We're not nearly as large as those other games, so obviously we're going hard after uh, kind of eSports, and I can give you a perspective on why that works for us. Hi everyone, my name is Ari Evans. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Maestro. We focus on game publishers, teams, and leagues, trying to help them develop their eSports broadcast strategy, ways that they can better understand their audience behavior through a really robust analytics interface, and also better monetization tools, which is the big nut everyone's trying to crack right now. I'm uh, Matt Marcou. I'm the, this is a little bit of a mouthful, the Madden Competitive Gaming Commissioner at EA Sports. Um, so I work on Pierre Moore's uh, new division, the Competitive Gaming Division at EA. Uh, my primary focus is Madden, but I'm helping influence all the sports games there. Um, I come to you kind of from the perspective of someone who's uh, been an o OG in esports for a long time. I played in my first tournament uh, 23 years ago. I was started running tournaments 15 years ago. So I've really kind of seen esports level up from the grassroots community side uh, all the way up to the publisher developer side. Um, before coming to EA, I worked on uh, League of Legends. I started up the esports program for Riot Games, uh, designed the uh, League of Legends Championship Series, as well as their grassroots community program. And you have the coolest title of, of, <laughs> yeah. of, of anybody at EA. The, the non-mouthful is they call me the commish. So you can just call me the commish and we'll be good with that. And Citroen's cool with the idea that that's above EVP? That's like a step <laughs> towards God, commissioner, right? Uh, no, no comment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions for, for EA, particularly since you guys are taking a somewhat different approach than, than most people in most cases. And we'll talk maybe about Battlefield versus... Uh, uh, um, Madden and, uh, and FIFA. Um, okay, let's start in light of the self-identification within the audience, just a tiny bit of history. Not all of you have to do this, but, but I know Jonathan knows a lot of the history. We'll let him go first and kind of the history of esports, you know, the emergence of it uh, out of the East. Just put it a little bit in context. It's just a, you know, I think some people think this is something that just started three years ago, which is, of course, not the case. So give us a little context on, uh, you know, kind of Wikipedia history of esports. Okay, well, I'm... And maybe start with the definition. Well, I mean, that's, that's the hardest question, right? How do you even define esports? So maybe I'll, I'll pass on that first. <laughs> because, you know, is chess esports, is, you know, sports-based games esports, or only fantasy-based? But anyways, let me, let me pass on that. Uh, in terms of, like, a brief history... I'm sure there's lots of different like, themes out there, but the one that I've heard that's very general is that you know, competitive video gaming has been happening for, for many years, decades, uh, primarily emanating from, from, from East Asia. And in the last couple of years, it's gone mainstream attention due to the confluence of a few factors. One, Twitch becoming really huge, and two, League of Legends becoming really big, especially in South Korea where they actually, you know, they have esports players pump up Olympic uh, soccer players before their match. So, you know, with those two kind of major trends happening, esports got into the major, uh, you know, kind of the general population's attention. And, and now, you know, a lot of people are trying to get involved, you know, uh, traditional media players like networks, all the game publishers, and people like that, I guess, VCs. Okay. One of you want to give us a sense of what were the earliest games in esports as we talk about the history of esports for a few minutes? Yeah, I'll, I'll go into it because I, I think I played in some of them. Um, I mean, again, when I say I played in tournaments 23 years ago, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I'm, I may look really young. Uh, I'm, I'm 33, and when I was in uh, grade school, um, 
uh, fortunately, my mother was open-minded. She took me to video game competitions, console tournaments, like she took me to my soccer and baseball practice. So uh, I played in the Blockbuster World Video Game Championship. It's kind of like a high-score competition. I played in a Power Fest back in the day. Again, high-score competitions. You're playing Mario, Mario Kart, etc. But I think the first games that rang true as to uh, a video game resembling a sport were you know, the Dooms and Quakes and Counter-Strikes coming in the the early 2000s. So that's, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to draw the line of what's competitive, what's a sport, et cetera. But that, for me, was what really engaged me and kind of set me off on my way. So you remember 10, Total Entertainment Network. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I played on uh, Heat.net was one of my old school throwbacks. Yeah, I played Quake on Heat.net, yeah. Right, and they were playing, <laughs> I think, Doom on... Uh, on Major League Gaming, and if any of you know Raptor, he's kind of a famous early esports athlete, Dennis Fong, who runs a, uh, a couple of companies now, Lithium, and um, and uh, it's not Raptor, it's not the name of his company. It's, it is the name Raptor's of his company. Raptor's his company, yeah. And, 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 and that was his, uh, his uh, gamer tag, too, I think. His Thresh. Oh, Thresh. Thresh, yeah. Okay. So that's literally 12 years ago. Now, how much earlier did it start in Asia? Was it Korea first? Was it China first? Was it Japan? I would say StarCraft was the breakout moment in uh, Korea specifically. And when did League uh, when did when did League first start? And was it an esport right away? Uh, well, he he's saying yes. I'm saying I'm saying no. I mean, League of Legends launched in 2009. I think League of Legends benefited off of the merge of the MOBA genre. Uh, Dota, which it came before it, really started that com competition. So when you got into League of Legends, if you were a hardcore Dota player, you, you understood what to do right away. But um, I, I don't think League of Legends competitively got completely serious until about 2011 is when I'm going to pin it down. Yeah, I'll just maybe level set because there were a lot of new people yeah. in the room, right? So I think um, we hit on it, but esports, in my mind, just simplistically, is video games being played competitively at such a high level that they're interesting enough for other people to watch. So the fact that there's a spectating aspect to it in addition to uh, a competition playing aspect enables other uh, you know, forms of engagement, forms of monetization, et cetera. So I think that's the neighborhood of things that we're talking about, and it does have a long history. Uh, to me, it's really interesting that there is even an eSports track at a uh, conference called Casual Connect, because um, historically, uh, a lot of the appeal to esports are to uh, mid to hardcore gamers, people that are dedicating 40 hours a week potentially with the game, and it and in some ways is almost the polar opposite of something casual, at least historically. What makes most of these games historically an esport is the skill curve, the fact that there's so much depth and complexity, and it's so hard that I can tell the difference between a great player of League of Legends and a, and a not so good player in the same way you can tell the difference when you watch pro basketball. So anyway, that's uh, some of kind of the neighborhood of games that we're talking about. And a lot of these uh, games that are top esports now do have really long history. So the game Dota that was referenced, um, which League of Legends is maybe a cousin of, you could say, Counter-Strike Go, um, which you know, is, is built on a franchise of previous Counter-Strikes. I mean, these are, are, in some cases, 15 to 20 years of game mechanics that have been fine-tuned by the community to, um, to kind of lead up to where we are today. Go ahead, Ari. And I think that one of the reasons why eSports is, you know, speaking to Todd's point here, you know, eSports was kind of a thing when you had a bunch of friends over to your house to all watch each other play Smash or GoldenEye or Mario Kart or whatever it was before that. And with Twitch kind of gaining in popularity, there was all of a sudden a forum for this, for all these people who had experienced this thing when they were younger their whole lives to now all of a sudden be a part of a community in a very visible way on the internet. And that kind of really helped propel the whole thing forward and very quickly. Yeah, I'm just going add to add on top of that, I think, you know, friends always got together to casually compete and the question is like, who's the best out of all your friends? with um, you know, the advancement of the internet and all these technologies, after you figure out who's the best of your friends, you can move on. Am I the best of my block? Am I the best of my school? Am I the best of my state, world, et cetera? So which of you would like to, uh, to give us a brief one-on-one -on -one history on Twitch? First of all, and this is not meant to be condescending or anything near that, does everybody in the room know Twitch? Okay, because it's cool to not. That's one of the reasons you come to a conference. Uh, who wants to, uh, I mean, you're in the casting business uh, pretty much, Ari, aren't you? 
Sure. <laughs> I can speak to this. So, you know, Twitch wasn't necessarily the first one to kind of put live streaming video games on the internet. This was actually being done prior to that and in a few different attempts. There are a few other websites that started before Twitch um, and one of the ones that gained a lot of popularity around the same time was MLG. Uh, the two were kind of going at the same time. MLG stands for Major League Gaming, which was kind of supposed to be more of like a real organized definitely oriented more toward the esports side of things, and they were kind of growing uh, simultaneously. At one point in history, MLG almost acquired Twitch, actually, and that fell through, which could have totally changed history. But even before Twitch was a thing, it was actually another company called Justin.tv, which was, the concept was, this, there was this guy, Justin, and he was gonna start by streaming his life to people. That was like the, really the core concept. So it started off, and they realized that, okay, maybe my life's kind of interesting, maybe there's only so much of a limited, there's a limited audience for that. Let's open this up and let other people stream things. And it was very similar, you know, a lot of services started up around the same time, uh, like Ustream and Livestream, which were just generalized live streaming platforms for people to stream whatever they wanted. And, you know, the service was doing pretty well. This is Justin TV. It was doing pretty well, but it wasn't kind of seeing any explosive growth. And at some point, the founders looked at some of the major high-performing streams that were going on there, and gaming was one of them. And some of the co-founders, uh, specifically Emmett, but also you know Justin and some of the other guys, decided that they were going to roll the dice and focus in on just gaming and really verticalize around it. And that's what led to the birth of Twitch. Um, so it gained a lot of popularity. They were definitely aimed a little bit more toward the you know, everyday streamer becoming a partner. They really talk a lot about how many partners can make minimum wage on their platform and start to make it a real income, real living, which is great. Um, and I would say that, you know, even MLG, which was kind of growing alongside of it, that they just got purchased by Activision last year. Uh, so they're now, I guess Twitch is really the, the big, big player in the space now with a few other smaller guys like Azubu and Hitbox and a couple others that are in the space as well. So MLG was, was bought by Activision and Twitch was bought by Amazon. Right, Just Twitch is bought by Amazon. So everybody well. kind of, um, is there an Asian Twitch and, and did Korean live casting start really early? I mean, it seems like as American esports is taking off, which I'd say, you know, at, at the most the last five years, we've been studying it for, for three years or so. Um, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, was there live casting of, of Korean esports? I was a, a, Korean esports evolved differently. Um, actually, the the Twitch live streaming aspect you f you feel that influence more in American esports. In Korea, they actually put gaming on television on ga on game net. Um, so they went more the tr traditional it's on TV broadcast route. Where I think in, in I'll say in America it didn't quite catch on until there was this the live streaming internet uh, accessibility. Were they putting uh, archive streams? Uh, a la YouTube up in Korea at that time, or, or did it go on the air and it disappeared never to be seen yeah, I, again by anybody I, else? I actually don't know. I'm not the best to speak to that, but it was, it was more of a television phenomenon in Korea. And can you, one of you say a little bit more about the, the TV channel, TV channels uh, in Korea that are dedicated to esports? Todd, you were shaking well, your I, head. Well, I know historically, um, so first of all, the gaming culture in Korea, it's a very, South Korea, very uh, connected culture. They had broadband very early. It's a very social experience. So a lot of gaming is played in these PC bongs, which basically is a place, like a land cafe, where you go, you socialize with your friends, you might drink or smoke, and you play, and it's social. And that's, uh, it shifted a little bit away from that um, but that, certainly in the time frame we're talking about, was where these games were played. So you're playing online against others, and you're also physically connected with your friends. So it's very social, very competitive, and um, at least at that time, there were, I think, three different TV networks, the equivalent of ESPN for video games. So they were covering on what we would think of as traditional TV um, both live events and other video game content. So that was, again, you know, maybe 10-ish years ago. Um, so that's definitely the birthplace of, I would say, you know, that hardcore competitive gaming and also this idea of gaming as spectating. Now, it, it's taken a while, that kind of moved through Europe, through China, through Europe, I would say, to, the, to North America, uh, as the last major market in terms of sequence to kind of get on board. And, uh, you know, yesterday, ESPN 
uh, ESPN2 and ESPN University did, I think it was about 15 hours of programming um, covering EVO, a fighting game tournament. Uh, also, I believe uh, Madden um, was in there as well. So they had a rotation of multiple games um, that, they, that they put on uh, TV. So it's definitely taken a while, and Twitch is a big part of what uh, made it here because it, it kind of democratized the whole thing. You could do production very inexpensively through uh, Twitch, and then they also built a very large audience of you know, over 100 million a month, certainly. I don't know what their last public numbers were, but that or north of that. Uh, so that's a big viewership. Any, any guesstimation on uh, Twitch's revenue? More than 100 a year or less than 100 million a year? I know you guys all have opinions, so, because I've talked to some of you about it. Just, I, I think we need to have a sense. Twitch is the big, the big kahuna in the United States in esports. Is it a $100 million a year revenue company? Yeah, I think it's that or more. Somewhere around there, that or yeah. more. Yeah. Okay, competition. As long as we're talking about live casting and Twitch, let's go down the road on this. Talk to us a little bit about competition in the, in the, in the casting space, both live and I don't know what you call the other thing, dead, uh, Vod. archived. Huh? VOD. VOD, yeah, okay. Video on demand. Um, well, as was mentioned, um, there were a number of, of entries uh, kind of focused on gaming. We heard the history of Twitch, and there are others like uh, Azubu and, and MLG that was recently acquired. I would say the two biggest competitors viewership-wise uh, to Twitch right now are um, YouTube Gaming, which introduced a live uh, component recently, and uh, obviously they have a lot of gamers on the platform watching their their VOD content, their video on demand content. And then more recently, Facebook uh, has made a move into the space with Facebook Live um, again. And, and that's also, I mean, you know, just they've got a lot of people active on the platform, right? So I'm sure that is going to make an impact on live streaming in general, and there'll be an esports component to that. So I think those are the three um, big ones uh, in my mind, um, yeah, well, with MLG kind of being its own category uh, with the recent acquisition. By, uh, by Activision. And you said who bought Azubu, did you say? I, I didn't know they had been bought. No, not Azubu. I know they're hasn't been bought. in the midst of change. Right. Ari? Well, I was just going to add that Twitter is uh, picking up a lot of live streaming these days. They're actually streaming the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. They did Wimbledon last weekend or two weekends ago. I assume, given the popularity of esports on Twitter, that they will make a move in this space. That's probably a safe assumption. Um, I, I would also mention the mobile space Mob Crush as an emerging competitor. Uh, anybody else like Mob Crush out there? Anybody really focusing on Cam mobile? Camcord is another one Cam in Cord the same sure. category as uh, Mob Crush. Camcord is older than Mob Crush. Yep. Yep. There's also a young company that just raised Iron Forge, which is in mm -hmm. that realm as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about publishers then. Uh, and this will definitely give Kamish a chance to talk to us about, uh, about the, uh, the new definition of esports that they're taking on. Uh, but reading from one of our panelists here, uh, let's talk about what the game publisher's roles are, because it varies, right, from publisher to publisher and even game to game. Uh, what are their roles in establishing leagues, esports infrastructures, um, and, uh, and what are the pros and cons of how that's currently uh, being handled? Um, you're quite a bit different, uh, Matt, in terms of EA, right, versus uh, the bulk of the, of the games are hyper-competitive, professional players of this, and for Madden and, and, and FIFA, you're going in a different direction as a publisher, right? Well, it, there's still the, the high-level competitive play, but uh, you know, one thing, you know, at EA, we named the division the competitive gaming division. We made that conscious choice versus eSports, because to us, competitive gaming, you know, like, like I gave the couch play analogy, um, you, can, you can be competitive while being professional. And in, inherently, if you're playing a multiplayer game, whether you're, you're against people who are on a team, you're, you're, in, you're, you're being competitive, right? You're shooting for that high score. You're trying to win. You're pull, pulling out the W. So, you know, our focus is, for, for, to, to make sense to us, you know, we have to service our entire player base. It has to be fun to compete. You know, we have to, um, we, well, our goal is to make you feel like, make all our ga gamers feel like stars. So, you know, whether you're just getting out and you're learning the game, or you want to play against friends competitively, or you're, you're a Twitch streamer, or you are hitting that upper level of play, like Eric Problem Right, where you could be a Madden champion, we want that whole experience to feel, feel good for you. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it, but I, I think the, one of my core tenets um, as a commissioner is 
uh, you know, I need to ensure that the gameplay is fair, that our, our game modes are fun to play, uh, and then they also tr that that funness to play also translates on a live stream for someone who's not actively playing. You will not personally be conducting the drug test, though, correct? <laughs> no, I will not be personally doing it. <laughs> and, and expand just a little bit, and then I want to get the three of you to talk about uh, you know Blizzard and, and Riot and whatnot. Just explain for everybody a little bit more about the the thing that you're doing differently. I don't, you know, I've spent time with Peter and Todd and I don't even fully understand it yet. You know, what is the nature of this competitive Madden gaming um, with people that are not gonna be on the big screen, they're not gonna win big tournaments, the, the competitive but not the professional. What, are, what is it you guys are doing as a publisher for those people? Yeah, so I think when you, when you see the headlines these days, just level set, you know, in Forbes or, or whatever you're looking, you see the, pi the, the picture of the stadium shot, you see the video of the winner holding up the champion, right? And that's, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's not where eSports e or competitive gaming starts. It's, it starts much in the same way that recreational sports does. It's, it's a pastime, it's an activity. So let's, let's use football. It's, you know, if you want to engage in football, you can, you know, throw the football around, you can play flag football. That, that love of football understanding, you know, comes in the, the, the backyards and sandlots and schools of America. And that's, that's where esports grew from as well, right? It, came, it comes from the land party. It comes from that couch play, me challenging my friend to a game of Madden, right? Because, uh, you know, he's, I'm a Packers fan and he's a Bears fan and we need, we need to set all this now, right? That's where it all starts. And we, we here at EA are trying to focus on that entire experience. And, um, you know, a majority, if, 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 if you're a gamer, you're spending your time in the client, in the game itself. So it's about, you know, the experience where you spend, you know, 90% of your, your waking hours as a fan of that game. Okay. By the way, we will, if we have time, try to come back to the whole issue of training and, and improving and all that. Um, talk to us a little bit, Jonathan, we can start with you, uh, in terms of uh, pick your, your, your next favorite publisher and tell us a little bit how they're coming at eSports. Well, I think it's probably easier just to talk about the two general systems I see. Sure. I see kind of like a closed ecosystem versus an open one. And since I'm more familiar with Riot, I'll say, like, you know, Riot Games has a more, I would say, like, closed ecosystem where they own the league, they kind of, they make the rules, they enforce the rules. Uh, there are only a few tournaments that, you know, you could even run for League of Legends that are not run by Riot Games directly. Um, whereas the other, the other spectrum, uh, the company, I, I would say, is probably Valve, who have been more hands-off. And, and for them, it's a matter of, you know, kind of seeing how things go, experimentations, letting third-party ecosystem develop. Uh, and I guess, you know, one downside that, has, that I've recently seen over the last week was kind of like the skin gambling kind of issue that has emerged in, in Counter-Strike. And Valve last week decided to start issuing cease and desist letters around that ecosystem, which kind of grew up, uh, grew around Counter-Strike. I'm sure that some of you would like to know a little bit more about what skin gambling is, right? You're not all skin gambling experts. You're a skin gambling <laughs> expert, up or down. <laughs> Fill in people into this um, non-gambling gambling. Sure, so like the high level of skin gambling is in, in the game we're talking about, Counter-Strike, you could purchase skins for, for your weapons. There's, they're randomly generated by the game, they're, you know, there are ways to determine quality of it. Is, you know, is it a good skin? Is it a bad skin? There's a, like a company dedicated to like pricing these things, and there's a pricing API. There's a marketplace to uh, to buy and sell skins, and finally the third component, which is there there are areas, there are sites where you could gamble with these skins because they they're worth money. Um, you could gamble in a variety of fashions. You could gamble kind of on uh, on matches. You gamble on, you know, like through, through like raffle sites. You throw in 20 skins, and the winner gets 19. Uh, the site keeps one. Things of that nature. And how much money do you think uh, is going through this system? Is it tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions? So, the Bloomberg Bloomberg article says 7.4 billion, but I think that's that's got to be worldwide. Or even if it's worldwide, that seems like it's. It's it's high, extremely high. Um, I I don't know what the exact number is. I just think 7.4 billion is kind of high. It's maybe maybe in the billions, probably in the hundreds of millions. Just because I think when they took a look at the top 300 
uh, inventories for CSGO, it was something in the range of hundreds of millions, perhaps. Yeah. So based on that, maybe like a billion might be relevant in terms of like trading volume. Okay. You want to talk a little bit about publishers? Uh, do you want to say something about skin gambling also? Uh, or you I want to go back both. to publishers? I'll hit both. I, I mean, so one thing to know is, I mean, esports is definitely somewhat of the Wild West right now. And the, pub, the different publisher models is just an example of that. So you do have uh, from, from completely controlled from the publisher and their kind of judge and jury to completely wild, open API. Um, and a lot of publishers fall in between. This skin gambling, I think, just uh, kind of illustrates how it's very difficult to apply standards and, and regulation in the industry, which is probably a topic we could talk a lot about. I think everyone involved with the industry feels like for it to mature, there needs to be a bit more as far as um, some form of regulation or at least consistency or expectation setting. Um, but it's not clear right now where that answer is going to come from because the entities involved all have different motivations. So the skim gambling, I'll, the only point that I'll mention, in addition to just the fact that this gambling exists and that it's not regulated, which means that there's really no age gating, for example, um, there also in the past two weeks have been numerous allegations, allegation is kind, I would say, pretty clear evidence that uh, YouTubers, influencers, were directly involved with some of these sites. So cases where I'm a YouTuber, I've got a big following, I am expressing surprise in my video, where I suddenly get lucky and win a great amount of skins and uh, never basically divulged that I have a very uh, deep relationship, <laughs> including in some cases ownership of the gambling site. So all that kind of blew up in the past um, two weeks, which is part of why this publisher, Valve, is now getting more active, right? So, um, you know, I think the topic of skin gambling and gambling, gambling in general is a, is a hot one that we could debate. Um, but right now, in its unregulated form, it's, uh, it's pretty nasty. Okay, I'm going to come back and ask you about Valve in a second. Ari, right, you can say whatever you want, but I'd also like you to talk a little bit about Blizzard in terms of what, what they're, I know you're close to Blizzard, what approach they've been taking, closed, opened, if you, you buy into Jonathan's paradigm. Sure, so the first thing to tell people in the room, I, I thought this was really useful for me to hear a while ago, you know, why is it that the game publishers get to decide these things, right? If you look at a comparison to the sports industry, no one really owns the sport of soccer or football or basketball. But in gaming, someone does very much own the sport of League of Legends. Someone definitely owns the sport of Overwatch or any other title. And that totally changes the game, right? That's why there's so much difference in what people are choosing to do, because they do have that control and ability to do so. And how they choose, what rules they decide to put in place and the regulations are up to them. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, pros and cons to it being that way, right? And what's going to come out of it. Blizzard in particular, so everyone, I'm not, not even sure, but there's a new title called Overwatch. Has anyone in the room heard of it? Cool. I'm curious how many have downloaded it. So people are playing Overwatch, it's pretty sweet. Um, so this is, it, it's their newest eSport, and it's one of their main titles that was meant to be an eSport when they started to develop it, at least that's what they say. Um, so for some of their other games, there's been more of the open model, where a lot of different uh, a lot of different tournament organizers can use their IP and create their own events that have their own prize pools and their own rules and so on. And I think that's partially because they realized even Dota itself was a mod, like a community-made mod. It's based on a mod that was created by the community of an earlier, some of their earlier games, like the Warcraft series and Starcraft. So that's pretty interesting in itself. So for Blizzard in particular with this new game, they haven't announced anything in particular, but I think they're looking at some of the more traditional sports league type models where teams have ownership over part of it and there's more regulation around what they each have to do and players associations and things like that. I'm just curious in the audience, uh, and I'm assuming all of you have heard kind of what they are starting to do with Overwatch. I mean, you just very lightly said what they're doing, but the fact of the matter is they're doing exactly what you just said. Uh, they're building a league, they're selling teams. I'm just curious, you know, they, they're just starting. That. Had some of you heard about that? Had you heard about how Blizzard was taking on with Overwatch? Okay. Um, do you think that's good that they're doing that with Overwatch, or would you prefer they were back in the more open of the previous games? 
Well, Overwatch is taking off like a rocket, and I think that, especially with all the eyes that are on it right now, it's important that they take caution in what they roll out. So I think having a more controlled approach at this stage makes sense for the title. And I think that they've got a number of really significant people interested in taking part in this team ownership play, so it could work out pretty well. Do you see their behavior regarding uh, Hearthstone uh, more closed or more open? Uh, kind of somewhere in the middle, I guess, I'd say. Because Seriously. nobody can go out and use those words without their permission or they can be asked to stop. These are trademarks. I can't say Madden without your permission, or if I do it without your permission, you tell me to stop, I have to stop. And that would also obviously apply to broadcasting the game and so on and so forth. Well, what about uh, the consumer's friendliest guy in the world, Valve, uh, and most, most de-structured company, uh, at least in the United States? Tell us what their approach has been. Todd? Um, well, I don't work for Valve, but the, from the outside, uh, they... But you could uh, be CEO if you did, but you couldn't have the title. Th there you go. I'd have to... Uh, no, so Valve in general, you know, is a, is an automate first uh, sort of company, right? And so um, they they tend to outsource a lot of things. So they they um, in the case of Counter Strike Go and Dota Two, have focused on making the game, focused on making APIs, but basically let uh, the tournaments generally be run by other organizations, multiple other organizations like ESL and like community sites. And then, of course, with Dota 2, they, they started to uh, take steps towards some majors and having a major international event, and, and that's proven to be uh, a very lucrative model for them since they crowdsource the compendium and generate you know tens of millions of dollars that way. Um, we took a page out of their handbook for Smite, and that's how our prize pool got so big. So. Um, you know, I, I think honestly, for a publisher, different models can work, right? You, you, you need to choose a path that fits with your culture, fits with your community, fits with what life cycle the game is in. And uh, they've chosen that model, which has worked well for them, uh, and they seem to intrude only when necessary. Skin bedding is rose to a point where uh, they felt it was abusing their API and they have taken some steps, but otherwise they're much more hands off compared to, um, say, a riot with League of Legends. And as you four look into the future, uh, what games that aren't really hot esports games yet or games you expect to be coming out a year ago, a number of you on a panel would have said Overwatch, that was already in a huge beta. What are the games we should be watching that you think are going to become esports? You nobody can give me a single game. What a bunch well, of I'll, I'll plug my own studio. I mean, if <laughs> yeah. no one else is going to step through the door. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Smite's already a, a Smite's big, already big there, game I would sport, argue. but uh, we've got another game called Paladins, and oh, uh, at the high level, people will look at it and say, "Oh, it looks kind of Overwatch." We started it before Overwatch, way before Overwatch, but it's free to play, and uh, Overwatch is not, and free to play. Um, tends to work pretty well. So I don't think Overwatch is going anywhere, and in spite of it not being free to play, it's doing great. Um, but Paladins will be a contender. And I'll speak more generally that in the same way you saw, there was a trend of MMOs, then there was a trend of MOBA games, meaning League of Legends, Dota 2, here's um, uh, New Earth even, Smite, others. Um, there's now a trend of team shooters, right? Class-based shooters that you could say started with games like Enemy Territory, Team Fortress 2, Overwatch is somewhat within that lineage. Our game Paladins is within, within that lineage and there are others being worked on and others I'm sure I don't know of that also are in that category. So that's gonna be a next category of games. Is Clash Royale an eSport yet? Or will it be? Yeah, uh, I was so. gonna say, I'm a huge Clash Royale player. Um, I don't know if eSport, again, um, I think g going back to Todd's definition, uh, not only compelling to play, compelling to watch. Like, can you can you develop an audience around it? So I'm a huge Clash Royale player. I love the competition of it. Um, do I want to watch it? I don't know. I, I personally, you know, finding myself, I'm I'm getting, you know, I started in the Counter Strike scene. I'm getting away more and more from those Twitch games, uh, going more and more to to mobile games. So for me, it's that 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 mobile uh, component. How can I immerse myself in the competition? But again, not sure if it's an eSport or even if, if that's desirable. But what is important is the, the competition, the engagement of it all. And, and, and Supercell's hired an eSports uh, guru. 
uh, who, who already knows, we won't name names, but because that would because that would be an NDA violation. So there are clearly ones. And you said you said yes. You think Clash Royale's definitely uh, an esport. Right, for all the same reasons uh, he listed. But I also I think from a spectating perspective, it's quite interesting. But um, beyond Clash Royale, I think like just maybe a couple sleeper titles coming out uh, are like sports-based games. You know, like NBA 2K, FIFA, Madden. Just because I think. Everyone's been focused on the top of the pyramid. We assume the top of the pyramid is the, like the best competitors. And as kind of Matt mentioned, there's just a huge opportunity on you know, the, the base of the pyramid, especially since when you think about all the existing sports leagues and franchises getting in, I mean, it's very interesting to see how that evolves. You know, perhaps let's say you, you play NBA 2K uh, professionally, maybe you get rewards that integrate to your local club, you know, maybe like the Knicks or whatnot. So there's a lot more interesting things beyond just the video game portion of it, I'd say, when you involve sports. Yeah. And, and thank, big, thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> no, but I do, I do agree, you know, just to chime in there, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons I got into eSports, again, I, I, I came from, um, back to my story, like my mom would take me to, to my soccer or baseball practice. The reason um, I got into all this was I... I I played my, my baseball, I played my video game, and I said, well, why couldn't this video game have the same attention that my sport does? Like, I, I didn't see the difference growing up. So me, me coming back to work at EA on sports titles, it's, it's the circle of life, it's being inspired by sports, and coming back and helping that genre. Because, you know, the Madden Challenge and other competitions around sports games have been around for over 15 years. Naturally, the, those gamers are very competitive, um, and there's a natural translation between the physical sport and the video game. Um, I, I just think it's about someone actually putting in the time and effort to, to figure it all out, and that's uh, ho hopefully I'll be good at my job, and that's what I'll do. Is give give those go give those sports gamers a proper outlet to show they have the the mind of a competitor, even if they still if they don't have the the physical ability to uh, uh, grab a rebound bound off of LeBron James, right? <laughs> I'll be looking to see what what you guys do with community. I imagine we'll see a community on steroids around your games. Hi, I'm Ali. Uh, I spoke earlier today. Um, CEO of Vulcan. Um, a great panel. Uh, Mike, great as always. Um, do you guys have any predictions for esports this year? I do, but on just one layer of it, I think that the team aspect is there's a lot of issues there because, you know, as Todd mentioned, a lot of you know the allegations are you know whatever. I think a lot of like teams, esports teams, own skin gambling sites and therefore funnel that money to pay their players increasing average salary across the industry. So unless you could match that with your own uh, skin betting site revenue or maybe like VC or angel money, your, your team is like done. So I think that train, that, that source of revenue is going to be cut off and therefore we'll see more, well, I don't know what we'll see. Maybe, you know, that the team salaries will go lower, but the players' expectations are already high. So maybe they'll create like a players union to like organize around that. So there's a lot of issues um, on the team bubble side, I'd say. Just going off that, I'll, I'll maybe make one more specific position. I, I think um, you're going to see, you've already seen professional athletes or, or owners of traditional sports teams get involved with esports. So uh, Rick Fox, um, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, right? Uh, Mark Cuban is invested in the space. So I think in the next year, uh, the, one of the Kings owners, yes. Eric Cluey from the Raiders, if yes. I'm saying his last name right. That's right. So, I, I mean, I just think that the number of those investments, I, I can't put a number, but it's going to go hard. I mean, it's going to be more than double over next year of, of owners or uh, uh, high wealth individuals invested in traditional sports will be going hard uh, to eSports. So, I, I, I believe that those two predictions are probably on, part, on point. The other big thing that's happening is there's all this uh, investment interest and just overall global attention coming to esports, but despite how big it seems and is, it's also tiny in terms of revenue, like very small. And a lot of uh, companies and startups that are sprouting in this space are actually try having trouble figuring out how to monetize it. Most people in this room might be shocked to know that most esports leagues run at a loss. They actually, they're not a profit center. They're a loss leader as a marketing tactic to push the other main revenue streams of these titles, primarily in-game transactions. 
So my prediction of what's going to happen this year is that that's not going to last for too much longer. There's actually got to be a business here. So a lot of attention is going to be focused around monetization and how we actually get this huge viewership base to monetize better. One quick stat that might be useful to the audience. Um, Newsu published a report and they did this exercise where they took the total global revenues coming to sports and then divided by the number of sports fans. You get about $60 per fan or $56 per fan. And if you do the same thing in esports, I think it's about $3.50 now or somewhere in that range. So there's a huge gap. And that's mostly driven from a lack of sponsorship dollars, merchandise, and any other revenue broadcast rights. broadcast rights, which don't really exist right now. And that's in flux. Geico's that's sponsoring a, a team. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings are creating environments for, for gaming competitions. Yeah. So the corporate guys are coming in. Yeah. And the other prediction I have is just you're going to see most titles create some kind of like, well, well most titles that could be esports are going to have some basic esports infrastructure or events started around them, even the smaller ones. Prediction, Matt? Uh, just the increased professionalism and again to, on the note of corporations coming in, you know, both on the sides of, um, you know, teams have proper coaches, they, they have proper businessmen coming in, proper lawyers. So, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to all of that, but um, as we said earlier, the esports has been a little bit of the Wild West. Uh, it's been run, run by communities and by, by, by kids. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to continue to, to grow up um, people who are putting together actual business plans, um, ha have actually a plan to, to generate revenue, to support uh, both the gamers and anyone else affiliated as employees, paying them properly. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to, again, it actually being a professional industry, whereas you know, r right now it's, it's a little bit more on the size of um, a hobby activity with sizable money in it. I'm told there are actually esports groupies, though. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the advantages of sports have... Any, any, any parallel you have in sports um, already is there in esports. It's just going to be more and more magnified and, and, and become more and more true and grow. Yeah. Uh, hi there. My name is Nick. I'm uh, part of the uh, indie dev uh, group that's going on here. Um, I just had a question in terms of uh, the open versus clo closed environment. And are... Uh, games like Dota and CSGO kind of anomalies in the industry because they're kind of the only two that really have an open system that's worked well. And I feel like a lot of it's based on their history. Like, they've been, they're games that have been around in other forms for a decade or so since Warcraft 3 was Dota and CSGO was a mod like a decade ago. And their community had to build up from, from the ground up on its own prior to the introduction of streaming systems such as Twitch. And you see now a lot of companies instead taking the hands-on approach because they really want that fast growth in the esports industry. So is it really even possible if you're kind of uh, a, a new um, video game company starting up and you're wanting to get into the esports industry, can you really even go the open source kind of route in terms of wanting to grow your user base that way? Because you, you kind of need that initial push to get going and games like Counter-Strike and like Dota have had that sheer amount of time for their player base to kind of grow on their own and they've had to go through those hardships of we didn't really have a support from anyone else and we had to kind of gather together as a community and build our own thing and then so now that there's this new title out we just kind of continue doing that. So I, I think every uh, everyone in the ecosystem would say you do need the community to be involved from day one. It's it's commonly said you can't, you know, esports isn't a push from the developer or the publisher, it's a pull from the community. and. There haven't been any exceptions to that that I can think of. Anyone who comes out too hard out of the gate declaring themselves an eSport, that's kind of the kiss of death. So that has been the case, uh, continues to be the case. And then it's really just a matter of how much and how soon other uh, entities help harness that community appetite. And some games have done it successfully, uh, some publishers using a third party like an ESL or an MLG or even just folks at Twitch that are getting involved and then sub-publishers say, no, that's core enough to our strategy that we're gonna actually do it ourselves. So in any case, you need to kind of test the waters and make sure the community actually has an appetite for the game to be played competitively. Um, I think either, either approach can work if that appetite is there, but you can't force it if it's not. Hi. Uh, David uh, from uh, Septini Korea, or mobile ad agency. 
Uh, to answer your question about groupies, yes, there are esports groupies. Uh, I know for sure they are in Korea. Usually they have their own cheering section. They have flowers and cookies, homemade cookies baked for their favorite esport gamers. Uh, my question is, it's a two-part question. First question is, uh, where do you see the growth of esports for mobile games? I know you guys touched base on that briefly with Clash and, and uh, I believe, Vainglory. Um, second part question would be, uh, with the uh, Pokemon Go phenomenon, originally Pokemon started out as a, uh, a, t a television show, and you would see them battling uh, within you know, stadiums, right? Um, what's the likelihood of us seeing Pokemon Go being you know, viewed uh, live, you know, filled with you know, 50,000 stadiums? Like, is that something uh, likely to happen? You know, I'm sure you know, sometime in the future, but uh, yes. Pokemon Go, Go is, a, is an eSport? Okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think for an eSport, there's, um, there's a difference between a great multiplayer experience and a true competitive game mode. And I'll go back to Madden for an example. Like uh, in, in Madden, we release the, the NFL franchises, and you can play them, and you can do Packers, Bears, Seahawks, 49ers, et cetera. But those, those teams are, are, are tuned to real NFL standards. Um, there's not like a, a, a game balance to where there's intelligent choices that you need to make, uh, a deep intelligent choices you need to make, um, which is why for Madden we released game modes like Draft Champions and Mutt Salary Cap, where there's, there's a deeper strategy to how you construct your teams rather than you know, play Packers, Bears, Fortnite, et cetera. And to, to go to your question on Pokemon Go, I think Pokemon Go is a, you know, there are, there are, there's also a Pokemon fighting game. There are more competitive games. So Pokemon Go is a great, experience but is there uh, and it's a it's a competition to accumulate status and fame but is it really a a 1v1 competition where i am engaged with another person and i am making choices and countering choices that another person is making so that's where um you know that's where i, I kind of get towards yes it's it's fun it's a it's a game is it yet a competition and then again the, the third tier we're kind of alluding to is is that fun to watch, right? So if we're gonna, if I'm gonna distill down maybe three simple steps to are you an esport? Like, is it engaging? Or you know, maybe four steps. Is it engaging? Are there choices? Uh, is it engaging? Are there choices? And are those choices fun to watch? And for me, specifically, Pokemon Go is more like, oh, that's a fun experience, but I don't know if it's a competition. But there are other Pokemon games. There's a, there's a, again, po uh, there's a fighting game. I forget the name of it exactly, but that is truly a competition. Hit the nail right on the head. The only thing I'd add to that is that um, I think you could potentially see it in a stadium if it were actually AR instead of what they're, what some are calling it to be AR. It's actually not really an AR title. It's almost like Magic Leap, like yeah, the hologram. Yeah, you know, if one day when we have contact lenses that have the AR UI on them and we're all seeing in the stadium this fantastical creature that doesn't, that isn't actually there, yes, right? Presumably, that could be a situation where that could be real, and I think that time is going to come. It's far off, but if you look at Magic Leap and other things like that, like it's definitely going to happen. If you play with the Vive, it's pretty incredible. And the first part of your question was mobile games. Comments on uh, either any of the existing ones, such as Vainglory, we talked about Hearthstone, or new mobile games, or how big do you think mobile? Or is this really a PC space to stay? It's the big key is exactly what Matt said a minute ago. Is it fun to watch? It has to be like a huge component of that, right? If even with Clash Royale or other titles like this, like if you don't find that fun to watch and a mass audience doesn't find it fun to watch, then it won't rise in popularity and get to that level that everyone's looking for it to be at. And I think that is one struggle, even for games like Vainglory. They've picked up a pretty good viewership, but is it fun enough to watch? And I think that's actually another prediction, possibly, that game publishers are thinking a lot more about that question, which is very, very different from what does a game player want to play? What is fun to play is really different from what is fun to watch. I think you're going to see a, a big distinction and more resources going toward the latter this year. Just the one point. I, I think Clash Royale is an eSport, and I think it's getting high viewership on Twitch and other platforms as well, and we'll see if it has sustaining power, but it seems like Supercell, now Tencent as well, are, are going to go hard, and they've already put tournaments in the game as a feature. So anyway, it feels like that's going to stay and be an eSport and, and uh, probably have... Uh, broader appeal potentially than maybe something like Vainglory, but uh, which is also doing well. So um, the one thing I guess that we think about is uh, is play session. So um, I don't think there's anything magic about the PC platform, 
but there is something today about it taking some time to accumulate viewership on a platform like Twitch. And so a lot of mobile games are designed around short pick up and play sessions of, of three minutes to five minutes. Vainglory is a little longer, I guess. And um, you just need to then consider that in your, uh, in your content strategy for viewership because it's different from a League of Legends game or Smite game that you know, might be 45 minutes. So you just have to um, somehow have a game that marries p short pick up and play sessions that work for a mobile gamer audience, but also a tournament format that's interesting for people to watch when it might take uh, you know, 10 minutes just to have people know that your stream is on and then another half an hour to kind of get into it. You want a couple hours of programming there to really get maximum viewership. So that's just something game developers um, will have to figure out. And I think we're really at the forefront of what we call mobile esports, right? I mean, we briefly talked about like PC-based esports earlier. I mean, when you look at Niantic, the publisher of Pokemon Go, they, they have like an esports division. They're the developer. Developer. They have a you know, esports division. So they're thinking about it. What will that look like? You know, who knows? But I think just by the sheer number of mobile devices, you know, that exist in the market globally, there's a huge opportunity. It's maybe someone will think of a way to do it in ways that we can't imagine at the moment. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be mimicking what has worked in PC esports and just like bring that to mobile. I don't think that's going to work. It's going to be something new. Just kind of like the whole Pokemon Go experience in itself was rather new but seemingly kind of simple that delighted a lot of fans globally. You can look at 10 different teams in 10 different parts of the world all playing and competing against each other and their GoPro. Basically, it's an exciting topic. Um, but maybe two questions. Um, like Valve released a statement, but maybe for the question to be valid for everyone else. Um, they said you cannot use the API to have automatically sent trade offers. Um, what, what are your thoughts on manually accepting trade offers, which is they, they actually left the gap open. So how do you think the development will be on that in the future? And also for you guys, is there a difference between skin betting and skin gambling? Because they specifically said gambling and there's a lot of talks about is betting any different or so maybe you guys have like 30 seconds. It's all going to come down to what Valve actually enforces. Their language can be interpreted in multiple ways. So it's just going to be like what, if any, actual cease and desist actions they, they take. So they've kind of set some signals out there. I don't know that any of us can, can read their minds on what they're going to do. So that, uh, you know, that's what will actually uh, demonstrate what changes will, will take place or not. Can you imagine these 80-year-old men and women on the Supreme Court having to decide a Supreme Court case on, on eSports, that, that actually could be a comedy. Uh, okay, five, five or ten year, I can only imagine, you know. Uh, five or ten year predictions, and I've got one too, so we'll start with, uh, with Kamish down there. I mean, uh, I think I'm a little tapped out on my predictions. I mean, <laughs> I mean look, I, I got into this, you know, 20 years ago predicting that, um, you know, a video game would start to resemble a sport, and I think we're we're just more more and more we encounter boxes and we're just ticking them off like is it competitive can we watch it uh can i you know can i make money off my franchise team can i gamble on it um we're just we're running honestly i think we're running out of those starter boxes to to check and it's it's just more about you know the last one is um can this be a sustainable profession for for the usual set of players so uh, you know it's a boring prediction but i i just think we're we're already there and we're just going further down that route Five or longer term prediction, Ari? We're seeing a trend right now where there's new game formats that are being developed based on technologies for the viewers to engage with the players in different ways. Haven't seen like a killer app version of that implemented quite yet, but I think that there could be. And if they figure it out and it's fun, it could lead to totally new class of games, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I also think that it's inevitable that we're going to get to this like quasi physical slash AR mixture, new sports, you know, with different types of gravity that aren't really in the real world, that could enable totally new kinds of esports that are kind of regular sports, but are, have some kind of you know e electronic or virtual component. Looking forward to those, <laughs> like blitzball. Everyone, everyone, you know, okay. Todd. Um, 
So today, the way teams are structured is, is kind of virtualized, which, which fits a virtual sport. But we see competition come alive when it's region versus region, like US versus Europe. And I think that five years from now, the team structure is going to be uh, geolocated. So there will be the Atlanta team, there'll be the Sacramento team. Um, and that way you can really develop this pyramid infrastructure from high school to college to local team. And that's going to disrupt everything. Uh, I think at the highest level, sports will become more like esports, and esports will become more like sports, kind of like what Todd is saying. From the esports side, you know, more local infrastructure, people realize the integration, you know, sports team owners and, and, and leagues. Uh, and from the sports side, we already know that you know, NFL games being broadcasted on or streamed on Yahoo and now Twitter. So both sides are beginning to see the benefits of doing it, you know, their way, quote unquote. All right, mine is five years from now, there'll be more professional players in esports than in golf. And 10 years from now, there will be more revenue in esports than golf. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Thank you all for participating. Yeah. I actually, I was going to throw in my, my, my one on that topic is in five to 10 years, we will stop referring to uh, the collective power of esports and we will start saying, hey, this individual game versus the NHL versus golf, et cetera. Um, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. It, you know, you can't, esports is not like the Olympics. You just don't lump it all together. It's, it's about the individual fan base and those individual fan bases will be larger than some of the traditional fan bases we know. Great, thank you all.